Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, and today we're joined by Davion Ross, co-founder and president of Shot Tracker. We're going to be talking about something we've never talked about before, transitioning from a B to C to a B to B IoT company. Davion, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure and a privilege. I'm, a, I'm excited to get into it. So thanks again for having me. Well, we've been excited to have you on the show for a while, um, and we had to wait until just after March Madness to get you on the show for reasons <laughs> that the audience is going to understand in a minute. But So I usually ask guests to give us a little overview on uh, their company for folks that aren't familiar. I think more people are familiar with you than realize it, but uh, level set us here. Tell us a little bit about Shot Tracker. Sure. So, um, you know, Shot Tracker is a sensor-based technology to track statistics and analytics. Um, if you're watching any of the Big 12 games on ESPN and you see them bring up data or anything to do with a shot chart or any type of interesting analytics, um, that's us. We power it. It actually says on the bottom, powered by Shot Tracker, um, when you see some of those statistics. Um, we have a sensor that goes on the player. It's, it's, it's really small, almost much smaller than a matchbox, about the half the size of a matchbox. And then we have a sensor in the basketball. Today we work with pretty much every one of the collegiate basketball manufacturers, so Spalding, Wilson, Nike, Under Armour, Adidas, uh, Moulton and Bodden, are more international, but we work with them also. And then we have sensors around the arena or the stadium, and we're able to track the location of the player and ball within two to four centimeter accuracy. And then we have a whole algorithmic layer that takes that, excuse me, that takes that, um, that juxtaposition of the player data and ball data and builds and automate stats, you know, in real time, not only box score stats, but any type of advanced analytics, anything from paint touches to, you know, number of passes in a possession to the impact of uh, catch and shoot versus one dribble versus two dribble or distance between the defender and the player. So, um, yeah, you know, sometimes people are more familiar with us. You may have seen us also in USFL on the football field, which is, is new for us. Um, but yeah, that's who we are. We're a sensor-based technology company, really focused in sports. I uh, so I've been I've been tracking you guys for a couple of years. I'm a big fan. When when you mention when you say that you can track the player and the ball, it, it, the sensor is just in the ball, or or is there anything on the player's person physically? Yeah, so we actually have a, a small sensor on the player. Also, it actually goes just inside the uniform on the shoulder. And, you know, that's how we're able to get the algorithms because we have this positional data X, Y, and Z, which, you know, Z is, 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 is uncommon, but we do both. We do all X, Y, and Z of the player and ball. And that's how we're able to automate stats because if you know where the player is, you know where the ball is, um, you know who has the ball at any point in time, you're able to write algorithms to, to somewhat infer what's going on in the game from a statistical perspective. So we, I mentioned at the top of the episode that uh, one of the defining elements of what I wanted to talk to you about is this B, B2C to B2B uh, focus. I could see where this technology would be incredibly cool at the individual level. You know, you're practicing, yeah. you want to have like the analytics relative to your own shot performance and things like that. And there aren't that many networks. There aren't that many NBA teams so that the, you know, the, the uh, market size might seem uh, at first blush kind of small, but of course you guys have made a huge business out of it. Can you talk about what that looked like in the early days and what caused you guys to say, Hey, look, let's, let's, let's shift this thing. For sure. Well, you know, I think that there's a lot of, we, we were in the midst of this phenomena and this, this change in, you know, how people were, were actually working out. So I, I played I played for Trinidad National Team. I played in, in college. And when I was in college, we used to shoot like 500 to 1,000 jumpers by ourselves in the gym, you know, and I was tracking this stuff manually myself, right? Um, but I will tell you, it you know, it took you an extra 30, 45 minutes in the gym just because you're tracking and you want to know where you, want, where you took shots from, how you did. So automating that was our first thought process. And we went into market with a product. Uh, we actually did a crowdfunding campaign. It sold out in like a week and a half, which was pretty cool. Granted, it wasn't a ton of units because it was our first prototype. And as we went through that process, what we realized was, you know, we live in Kansas. So 
unless you got a basketball court on the indoor, you know, during the winter months, you're going dormant. Um, we, we, we actually sold the product as a one time and we felt like, you know, um, it didn't allow um, for a subscription based business and you haven't to sell the product every time. Um, the other thing that we learned was that, you know, pretty much people were using our product in a way that we hadn't planned. So, for instance, this was supposed to be a one player, one ball, one hoop, um, because we weren't doing any identification of who the end user was. Right. Um, so what would happen is you had multiple people. There was this phenomena changing where everybody was working out with a trainer and there were like five or six kids in the workout. And what we were seeing is that the conditions and what was happening, the evolution of how people were working out was not conducive for this one-to-one -one relationship. Um, so, and, and we just think that the technology that would be needed to bring this to fruition was not something that was going to fit the, um, the, the consumer model. Um, you know, that's probably changed now because with the evolution of the Pelotons of the world, you know, people are spending 2,500 bucks on a bike. And at that point in time, we didn't think that people would spend the amount of money to make it a consumer-based product. So from our perspective, although we had great traction, we had good usage, um, what we were seeing is that coaches were actually using our product in practice because they wanted to find data on how their teams were performing and being able to double click and go at the individual level. So that's why we made the big transition from B to C to B to B, um, where you know we won't necessarily send a consumer, but we're actually selling to teams and then being able to get that data and making it available to the broadcaster. I think the thing that people don't understand about broadcast is that once you see certain stats that are showing up on the screen, that's a manual process. They have six, seven, eight people who are sitting back there looking at the game, trying to do analysis. And with the evolution of IoT and machine learning, we just thought that there was a really good and unique opportunity to streamline it and, and, and have that data flow automatically into the graphics engine to make things really easy from, from a broadcast perspective. When, when uh, you guys were looking at some of the technical challenges, I mean, were, were there needs that the B2B market was saying, listen, if, uh, for example, one of the things we hear a lot is consumers will say, oh yeah, hey, look, I'll, I'll, you've got a, uh, you're going to sell a hundred units on a prototype basis, pay today, I'll get it, you know, when you're ready. Consumers seem very open to that idea, especially at the $150 per unit or whatever the cost is, yeah. sub $1,000 level. Companies, particularly larger companies like CBS, you know, or uh, the Phoenix Suns um, are much less comfortable laying millions of dollars out for technology that's not quite ready, that it has development still in front of it. Is, is that been you guys' experience or is this something where they were saying, look, we've been searching for this. We're willing to take a flyer on you guys and be a part of the development process. Man, I think it's really, it's really dependent on who it is. You know, most people say that they want the, like the new stuff, but they're not really ready to deal with the, the challenges that come with the new stuff, the untested, the unproven. Um, but I, I think it's a little bit of a balance. There's certain people who have the appetite or the willingness to work with startups to do it. And I think that there are some folks in the sports space that really, um, they see it as an opportunity to get ahead and be, you know, almost a leader in the space. But there's others who they say they are, but they're not really ready for the things that come with, you know, a brand new system. So I think it really just depends on the individual. I mean, we've seen both. We've seen... You know, people, I mean, I always tell people sometimes when, you know, you're a tomato, you'll never be salsa to some individuals. And those individuals, you know, they just can't get past who you were in the first year when you just bring in the product to market. And now you're in year three and you have a better product, but they keep remembering all the issues that you had versus year three. So it's year one. So it's, I mean, look, it could be risky in some situations depending on the individual. Um, but I would say that there is a group and we've had some customers, namely KU and Bill Self, who have been like really critical players and were the first to test it. And, you know, they're still rocking with us. By the way, small shout out, if you think about it, you know, two of the final four um, members were, were Shot Tracker customers this year. 
last year's NCAA championship shot tracker customer the year before NCAA championship shot tracker customer. And, you know, with, with you know, so, um, you know, some of the, and, and two of those were really early customers in the championships who actually stuck with us, gave us feedback and really worked with us for it to be an iterative process. Well, let, let's stay on that for a second. So we are so far off script, by the way. So for the audience, you know, I'll give you guys a look behind the scenes. So I always meet with guests before and we'll have a little pre-chat about some of the things we're going to talk about. None of the things we're talking about now, we are so far <laughs> off of the things that we, but this is great stuff. So, um, I, you know, this is not unusual and, and it's incredibly important. And so I want to like drill into this a little bit. So basically what you're saying is world champions innovate, right? I mean, they leave room to be attached to innovation. Of course, they're not going to like bank on it all the way. For those that uh, have recently watched the, I think it's Amazon movie air about Jordan and Nike, you know, Nike, this was not some room for innovation. This was like all in pray it works. And then of course, you know, the guy ended up being the best athlete of all time. But it sounds like what you're saying is, hey, look, there's a little bit of a trend here. Like if you want to be the best, you've got to leave some room for innovation. And innovation is painful. It comes with breakage. I, I hear, I believe that's what Yeah, no, doing, I think that's right? the case. Because look, the thing about it is, is that like, you know, I, I think that most people have access to the same stuff, <laughs> you know, all yeah. the time. So to go away above and beyond, I mean, it's like everything else, right? If you want to go you know, if you, you can't do the same things that everybody else is doing and get different results. So I think that's what you see with, with innovators and world champions, people who are looking to get that edge. They got to put some risk out there and they're willing to try some things that haven't been done before or that people haven't been willing to try before, mainly because they think it'll give them an edge. And um, I see that across the board, whether it's understanding you know, how IoT products help you do load management. I mean, we see a lot of load management in the NBA, whether, whether or not that's good or bad, um, it is what it is. But I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say um, companies, corporations, I mean, everybody has to take some level of risk. And if in, in a competitive market, um, you got to find what differentiates you. And sometimes that's just taking an edge on some of the things that are, you know, may not be guaranteed, but but you're willing to swing for the fence and hopefully get some good results. Right, right. You know, and a swing for the fence, I mean, it, it, to you, now we're in a baseball analogy, but, <laughs> you know, the swing for the fence, you don't get just one swing in it at bat, you know, so you reserve one strike and you say, this is the one where I'm going to really here we go. You know, I'm going to yeah. take a big swing at this thing, but if it doesn't connect, I got a couple more. Of course, if you pop it up, that's the end, but then you got more at bats, you know, but if sure. you're going up there and you're just kind of standing and trying to do the safe thing. And I think the note for the VPs out there tuning in today is if you're, if you're aiming for the C-suite, you know, you, you must reserve some capacity to be partnering with companies doing innovative things. You don't have to bank on them all the way. But you, you yourself are not going to rise if you've not done some things that are different, unique, et cetera. Yeah, you got to push the envelope. That's what it comes down to. You have to push the envelope. And look, it may not all work out, right? And I think it definitely won't, in fact, probably, yeah, it, right? I mean, yeah. And from my perspective is, is like, you know, even with my team, if we try something and it doesn't work out, like I'm more excited that we tried it and we had the kahunas to try it than you know, like not being very scared that it may not work out. So what it may not sure. work out like, but it may, what if it did, you know, and then you start seeing the benefits. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, depending on who you are, your style, um, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for innovating and really pushing the envelope, making some stuff happen. All right. So we're an IOT podcast. We got to talk about some IOT. I know you're a very technical guy. I want to talk about some of the technical problems you guys have solved. I've got two um, the first one, arenas. W what a difficult, unique, technical environment to have to operate in. You talked about margin of error, two centimeters, you know, so like less than an inch. And you've got a lot of noise in there. You got a lot of things happening in that space. Talk about some of the challenges of operating in an arena environment and how you guys solved them. Like, what did that look like? What did you uncover? Yeah, for sure. So, so the funny thing was, I remember we were at a final four, right? And it was right when we were making the transition from B2C to B2B. 
And one of the things that we were trying to figure out, like the Final Four, I can't remember how long ago, but it was probably 10, 12 ago. They went from 12, 10, 12 years ago, they went from holding the Final Four in like a traditional arena with 20,000 people, excuse me, and started holding it in football stadiums and arenas that could hold 80 to 90,000 people. And I remember us walking around with our consumer product, which was like BLE based, Bluetooth Low Energy. And man, if you got five to 10 feet away, the, the, the devices just can see each other, right? Because you've got 80,000 people in a location, you know, some percentage of those folks got two phones. So the first thing that we realized in that test is that BLE is not the solution to work in an environment like this. Um, so that's when we started to look at what are the right mechanisms. We came up on ultra wideband and um, ultra wideband, you know, so be it Bluetooth is, is traditionally like Wi-Fi on the 2.4 frequency, but ultra wideband, we can operate on like channel three and channel five, which is like anywhere between, I'd say 4.0 or 3.5 and 4.2 frequency and then 6.5 gigahertz. Um, so we started to do ultra wideband and look, that wasn't a very common thing. So there weren't a ton of people who understood ultra wideband but it's a communication protocol that we could, could be used for like um, indoor location tracking. Um, and so we had to go through that whole process, bring that together, bring that to market. Then when you think about like the FCC limitations and utilizing it under the right power requirements, I mean, that was a challenge. We spent a lot of time um, using off the shelf antennas. And, you know, sometimes those antennas, because we actually put in the sensors on your skin, you know, sometimes like they're, you know, they're directional antennas, right? So sometimes you're losing some of the power through the back or they're multi-directional antennas and you're not getting the right power from that. So those are issues that we had to solve. Um, we had to do custom antennas to get the right, you know, we just did a, a, a custom antenna and it increased our, you know, we got like plus 14 dB, you know, in regards to our level of accuracy and power. Um, so it, look, there is no shortage of stuff for us to solve everything from making sure we can get the accuracy. Remember, we're trying to figure out if this ball is actually going through a hoop. So there's a certain level of accuracy that we need there. And we need it not just X and Y, we need it X, Y, and Z. So we're trying to figure out how do we get like the smallest standard deviation? You know, we, we have to figure out, you know, what's the right frequency. Sometimes we were sampling the data at 120 Hertz. But there's an equation there. If you have 120 hertz, maybe you only could have 50 objects in the network. Well, that's not going to work for football. So then we had to figure out how do you actually adjust that on the fly based on what's going on. One of the funniest things that we had to de deal with is I remember when our first USFL game, we were down testing in Birmingham. And, you know, so we got the system set up. We're going through the process. And my CTO, Clint, who is just a magician, when it comes to the, I'm technical, this dude takes it to a whole other level, man. He, he reverse engineers stuff and brings it back even better. Um, he's a downright genius. Um, and, and uh, you know, I remember us being there and I'm working with Clint and we're trying to figure out and all of a sudden the system goes out and we're like, what the hell is going on? Got it back up, looking at the logs, can't figure out anything. Hour later, system goes out. Well, Finally, the third time it happens, and we notice that, wow, a plane is flying over. Well, the facility in Birmingham was really close to, to the airport. So fourth time come, we're like, okay, where's the plane? There's the plane. It's about to go down. It goes down. So one of the things that we realized after doing some research is because these, these airports were close, you know, they have a, a radar trying to adjust where the, 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 the ground is that utilizes the same frequency that we were utilizing. And because their planes fly in, they take priority and it just kicks us out of the frequency. So like those are the types of things we had to solve for. So we had to change a different channel. I mean, it was a cluster, man. But when you talk about deploying technology into an arena stadium, those are just a few of the examples that we had to get through. To, to, with all the noise in, in the market um, or the noise in the environment to, to, to be able to bring this solution to fruition. The, the other technical piece of this I found so interesting is battery. You know, so yes. you've got to, the, I, can, I can get my head around the sensor 
in the jersey. Okay, this yeah. one makes sense to me. I don't think anybody's going to notice a couple of grams on the, their shoulder, but you can't affect the, I don't know, uh, ballistics is not the right word, but the, the geometry, not even jump the, the weight of the ball and the way that the ball rotates. Yeah. I mean, a small thing that you change the course of one game, one time, you guys are in deep trouble. What did this look like to be able, and of course, getting into a basketball, no easy feat, yeah. you know? So once yeah, the thing is sure. in a basketball, that's pretty much in a basketball forever. Uh, talk about like solving the energy component of this. Yeah, for sure. So I still get nightmares on this. Um, I still get flashbacks. Uh, you know, I remember when we first started, it's funny because we went through this process and, you know, we, we had some really good relationships with the basketball manufacturers. The thing to note is that two things to note. One, you know, 99% of basketball manufacturing is happening overseas just because of the vulcanization process and the type of like pollution that goes into manufacturing basketball. It, they, they don't really happen domestically, right? There's mm -hmm. There's one company now that does an amazing job and, you know, these guys are doing it, doing some of the stuff domestically, but for the most part, all basketballs are manufactured overseas. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing what people fail to realize is that, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day, Spalding used to have a basketball that Kobe launched where you could actually press down spin and there would be a pump associated with it. And then you could actually pump the ball up. Well, the beautiful thing about it is that, you know, we, people had already solved how do you put foreign objects in a basketball? It may be that pump or it may be like just a valve to be able to plug in so that you could pump the basketball up. So from an inflatable perspective, that was already solved for us. And what people don't know is that when you put that valve, that's a foreign object. So what they had to do was put weight on the other side to balance the basketball and to keep it within spec. So for us, because we did a good job of making our sensors as light as possible, we could remove the weight that was put to balance out the valve and actually put our sensor in. Now I'm making it sound really easy, but it was really challenging, right? Because you wanted it to be, most basketballs had a spec for competition play that we had to meet that. So it took a lot of work on taking in some of the rubber, you know, changing the sureness of the rubber to make sure that it's imperceptible and like in the beginning, it was rough, man. I mean, people would see the basketball and they'd use it and be like, oh, something's wrong with this. And now we got to a point years later where it's somewhat imperceptible. But the biggest challenge that we had to deal with is when we first actually put the sensor in the basketball, it was a primary cell, mainly because we just had to get it to market. And primary cells are kind of like a Duracell battery. I mean, they're lithium ion, but they're, they're not rechargeable. And when we actually did the math, it ended up that we were only getting like 60 people were using the system so much we'd get 60 days you know like the our sensor would die before the leather in the basketball deteriorated and that was not ideal because these electronics were expensive um so we had to go through a process and we became up we came up with a resonant charging solution um so you know there's like one of the biggest phone manufacturers failed uh, one of the biggest watch manufacturers failed and this little old company in kansas city shot tracker was able to bring this to fruition and be the first company. So it's resonant charging. So that means it's charging over a distance. Um, we were able to put the sensor in the ball, use a coil, and then, you know, imagine if like this was your, you know, if this is your charging mat, I mean, we could actually hover the sensor three to five inches above the charging mat and it would still charge. And that's the tech solution that we put in the ball to make it rechargeable. So it was very painful. It took us a couple of years I mean, a big deal is making sure you could pass FCC. So imagine going into like most of these chambers and trying to see what is the pattern of the antenna and, you know, everything else that goes with it. So very, very painful process, but something that was, I mean, our back was, you know, not even against the wall. We were behind the wall. And um, by, the, by the, the hard work and efforts of the amazing team here, we were able to bring it to fruition. So definitely... You talk about the impossible. That was that was one of those things that was just, you know, um, again, a lot of sleepless nights. You, I re remember, you know, I go to all these uh, conferences in our industry uh, talking with IoT folks. And I always go back to this conversation uh, a couple of years ago. I talked to this entrepreneur. He had an ingestible IoT device. You swallow it and it would provide yep. some biometric information. And he was really excited. And I said, do you have a, a prototype? 
you know, a unit that I can look at. And he said, I do, you know, we're not displaying it, but yeah, here it is. And it was bigger than a person's mouth. And I said, how are you going to have an ingestible design? You know, like you've limited yourself to the boa constrictor market. That is that is the yeah. only, and, and I understand that, you know, you're going to squeeze with, raise some funds and squeeze some, you know, space efficiencies out of this thing. But I, I, I it was, it just struck me that like, you can't have an ingestible device. <laughs> it can't be ingested or else you don't have an ingestible device. Give us some scale. For, you know, in the early days when guys said something's wrong with this ball, where did it start? Was this like the old Motorola mobile phones from the 80s? You know, the Zach Morris phones no, as big as a shoebox? No. Or, we, and where are you at now? We, yeah, we're, we weren't that big. And, and to be honest with you, like, um, you know, it was more about like the manufacturing of the ball and finding the right way to do it. The engineering around the ball metrics versus the sensor. I mean, because our sensor has gotten smaller, but not that smaller. I think that, you know, it was more around just the physics that needed to be manipulated on, you know, the basketball. That was the challenge and not necessarily we had this substantial sensor. Because from our perspective, I mean, look, man, we were doing stuff on our sensors and in the manufacturing. Like, I mean, we were doing like smaller than most of the manufacturers they had the machinery to do it but they hadn't ever gone this small i mean we were using 0201s you know and everything from a manufacturing perspective and you know shout out to our electrical engineer this dude is look i've been so blessed to be around such amazing geniuses from our cto to our double e to our firmware engineer those guys are incredible and they are the reason that we are where we are today um, because they made that product extremely small and really I pushed them and they delivered on pushing the envelope to make our devices as small as possible. So for us, we, we never had like the Motorola. Now, maybe when we were doing the prototype and we weren't actually wanting to like spin a board and we wanted to use like some development boards to prove that this could be done, you know, maybe it was big. I remember going out to Golden State Warriors and putting our system on clay and my boy, German O'Neill. And at the end of the day, there was almost like, you know, a phone on their, on their hands to shoot, to test it out. And, but that was because they were development boards and that type of stuff. But once we start spinning it, man, we, you know, we knew what was necessary being athletes and basketball players ourselves, that would be acceptable to the market. So we, we had to push our manufacturers and everybody we work with to get as small as possible, which was definitely challenging. But we knew it was necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to, so this is somewhat unusual to this episode. We're going to be coming out to visit you guys in about six weeks. So before this episode goes live, if you're listening to this episode to now, we have by now visited uh, Davion's uh, facility. What, what uh, but I know that you guys have a pretty cool facility over there. Can we get a look at the inside of a basketball? Actually see this. If a person was to slice a basketball in half, is yep. is the is the sensor something they would see on the inside of a basketball? Um, they could see it by slicing the basketball. You won't see it because it's kind of it's, it's part of the vulcanization process within the rubber, so it's a little Got bit it. hidden. But you could actually see the form factor and the rubber around it. I mean, you'd have to cut that rubber and really get in there. Um, but yeah, it's not just sitting in the middle. Oh, you know, um, once it. you slice the basketball, because it is part of the vulcanization excuse me, vulcanization process. So uh, last question, sports fans, I think will understand where I'm going with this. So you guys work with, uh, with foot in football as well. Uh, football yep. had uh, a bit of a uh, football inflation PSI issue a few years ago with one particular gentleman who we're not going to call out today on the show. Is, is the PSI or the conditions of the ball itself something you guys track? So... It's not part of the things that we track. We try to stay focused on the things about the game. Um, we do know that there's elements that people um, can use to track about the actual metrics in the ball. And one of the things that we do try to track is to give usage, right? So, you know, we, 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 can, we can keep track of every dribble. Um, so once, once a manufacturer can look at the ball, they could say, okay, how many dribbles has been on this wall? Let's see how this leather held up, et cetera. But in regards to tracking the PSI of the ball, that's not something that we've focused on because there's just so many tools right now where 
you know, you just pop something in and it tells you the PSI. So it's, it's not necessarily worth it. And the amount of level of effort it would go to put even more stuff in the ball to track that. Um, I don't think that's something that we want to bite off right now. Got it. So deflate gate rem remains unsolved for. Yeah, deflate uh, gate one, everybody else zero. <laughs> that's right. All right. So let's go to our big finish. So you guys are doing cool stuff. We're really excited to visit your facility. Like I said, by the time anybody hears this, that will have happened by then. But uh, what's next for you guys? What, what are you really excited about looking forward? Yeah, man, I'm excited for, you know, we started off basketball as Shot Tracker. Our company name is really DD Sports. And then we have the Grid Tracker product, which is our football product. So I'm just excited. We just had some really new antennas that, that gave us like some substantial gain, which is going to help us as a company. So from my perspective, I'm excited about the innovations that we're doing, like with the new antennas and, you know, how we're pulling together. And then the other thing that I think about is that we're doing a ton of integration with video, which is really exciting, using our sensor data to control video cameras, that type of stuff. That's pretty cool. And then, of course, lastly, but not least, is like the machine learning components that, you know, we're putting on top of our data to actually help with whether it's, you know, additional data, um, you know, prop betting or just anything that has to do with the, you know, machine learning around data, because we're providing so much data in such with subsecond latency that it is providing some opportunities for us. So I'm excited about those few things. Yeah, I mean, when you guys begin to solve for next level player level data, you know, hey, this guy's yeah. the most underrated guy in the NBA kind of thing. This guy's most overrated. I mean, this is just, it seems to me, next level stuff that's going to put to put you guys over the top. I also curious, just can you muse quickly on baseball? Is baseball on the horizon? Baseball is suddenly obsessed <laughs> with spin rate, has always been obsessed with metrics. Is this something you guys are looking at at all? So we haven't looked at baseball and there's a couple of reasons. One, uh, there's a solution in place called StatCast that using like sonar, radar and computer vision. And you know, the, the places where we really shine are where there's a lot of occlusion. You know, so like basketball, a lot of big bodies together, football, a lot of big bodies together, rugby, you know, soccer, baseball, not so much. I'm not saying they're, they're big bodies, but they're not necessarily, um, there isn't a ton of occlusion. So we actually think that baseball and soccer or, or computer vision is probably a much better solution because you don't have the, um, the, the, the challenges of having to like instrument players and balls and that type of stuff. Um, so I don't think we'll ever go to baseball just because it has a solution in place. And, you know, the players seldom ever, you know, get close to each other, except when you're on a base and someone is actually guarding that base. So, Yeah, so tying this back to, to what we were talking about in the early part of the episode, we were saying if you're doing things, if you're not doing anything differently than your competition or that other person out there that's looking for the same promotion as you, if you're not doing anything differently, how are you going to expect different results? So leaving some space for innovation, leaving some space for risk is really important. And then here I hear you saying, you know, also knowing where your strengths are, knowing what you're good at and not moving into areas where you're not set up to succeed. It, it feels like those are the two big takeaways I'm hearing from you. One thing I want to hear uh, your take on before we cut you loose. We're over time and I really appreciate your time today. But you're a tech guy. You've been in the space for a while. Who, who out there in IoT land is doing good work that you think not enough people are talking about? Broadest possible, take it in any direction you want. What are you excited about? Yeah, I think there's two, two, um, two companies or two ideas that come to mind. Um, the first is I'm a big golfer. So, um, you know, I think Garmin just released a simulator that's, you know, not like the big heavy duty simulators and you know, I consider that, a, you know, an IoT device that has like, I mean, they're doing everything from computer vision to algorithms to math. And, you know, it's really it's really affordable so that the, you know, the, most consumers can pick it up. So that's one thing that I think is really cool. And the power that they've packed into that device is really interesting. And then secondly, probably about almost 12, 13 years ago, um, I was diagnosed with I was type one diagnosed with type one diabetes. Um, which is juvenile diabetes, but late stage. And, you know, when I first got in, man, just being an engineer, the first thing I was like, man, these devices are terrible. You know, like I couldn't, you know, connect to my device. I had to like be sticking my finger all the time. And, 
you know, 10, 12 years later, it's like they've come full circle. And so I like seeing the evolution. I thought about taking on the project myself, but, you know, I knew what it would take, you know, in regards to capital raising and getting through, you know, FDA and that type of stuff. And it's mostly large companies doing it, but I like seeing the evolution there. And now it's to the point where, I mean, I don't even have to prick my finger, right? I just, you know, put something on my, my, my skin for 14 days and, it's automatically communicating via Bluetooth with my phone, um, which is a, a we've come full circle. So I'm excited to see that type of growth and innovation. Although, you know, I had the idea for it like 10, 12 years ago, but I don't know if the technology was there to really bring it to fruition. Um, so it's cool to see it come into fruition now and hopefully it continues to get better and uh, and more and more exciting. So those are the two that I, I, I I'll talk about. There's probably others, but you know, just given our time, those are the two that I, I, I'm interested in. I'm excited about because it yeah, makes I my life it. easier. I, you know, easier um, it, health tech frustrates me because on the one hand, you've got laws and regulations and they're designed to protect people. And I get that and I respect that, but it just kills innovation velocity, which Done. in the long term does not protect people. You know, and so it yes. just it, it, it feels very frustrating to me. I'm seeing what you're seeing, which is a, a very low innovation rate of innovation in that particular industry because they mostly can't and they they, yeah. and they, they can't get uh, good corporate partners because the corporate partners are saying there's no way that we can bring this to market without, you know, getting sued or whatever. So it well, it the other thing like is that the. The other thing is that the people who who would innovate the startups, like the amount of capital you have to bring this to fruition just makes it so darn hard that people are like, I mean, that was the thing that I was like, man, I could, I have a vision for what this should be because I've been in tech. I understand it. I understand this, what sensors can do. I understand the communication protocol. I understand all these pieces. But then you think back like the non-tech stuff, it's like, Man, I don't know if I want to go through that to bring it to fruition. So, yeah, I get it one time. Well, Mr. Davion Ross, thank you so much for being on the show. Man, the pleasure was mine. I had a ton of fun. Um, it's not often I get to geek out and talk sports. Most times I'm doing one or the other. So this was um, this was a great time, and I truly appreciate you guys having me. Strong agree. Appreciate it, man. And thank you guys for listening. Join us next time as we interview another executive and talk about things that went wrong on a journey that went right.